they need to be wearing masks um, and so that they can go to school and, and not um, be held out for, for days from getting COVID. We have to st stop the spread and serve our students. Um, um, and okay, I still have more time. Uh, <laughs> it sounds like some of the people here are um, against teaching accurate history in school or wanna limit what our teachers can teach. Um, I think that that is, oh, I am? Oh, sorry. Please keep talking before um, because you have your time. Please allow her the courtesy to finish what she has to say. So just like the Pan-African Studies course, I mean, I think teachers should have the freedom to um, teach uh, the accurate versions of history. We shouldn't try to corral them into, um, there shouldn't be secret things about history they can't teach. That doesn't benefit anyone. Um, and it, it makes their jobs harder. Thank you very much. The next uh, agenda item that we will address is the next steps for the opening of school and the item on the agenda reads a new way forward, next steps for the opening of school. So we will speak in this order. Uh, Amber Clinney is number one, Chris Wakeman is number two, and Wayne Payne is number three. So Amber, would you please join us at the mic? One more time for Amber. Is Chris Wakeman here, please? Chris Wakeman. Wayne Payne, is Wayne Payne here this evening? We will move on to Michael Washburn, Christian Dodge, and Bonnie Logston. Michael Washburn. Thank you for being with us this evening. Sorry about that. Good evening. Thank you all for having me. Um, First, I'd like to just extend a thanks to Dr. Polio for so vigorously defending the health of the students that are his charge. Um, my name is Michael Washburn, and I have a kid set to enter first grade at Bloom this fall. And I just want to take a couple of minutes to stress uh, my position that in line with most of the guidance coming from the CDC, the KDE, and the governor's office, the JCPS enforce a universal mask mandate for all students, faculty, and staff. I think mask requirements are particularly urgent when it comes to elementary school students who have no means of protecting themselves other than relying on the good faith and mask use of their fellow students and the faculty and staff that, that work and care for them. Without requiring masks, as well as following all other guidance about distance and hygiene, children are going to be exposed to unnecessary and avoidable risk. I agree kids need to be in school. And on this, I think we can all agree, even the parents behind me who disapprove of the mask requirement, but uh, again, to echo some previous comments, mask will keep kids in school. Put another way, the lack of a comprehensive masking and other protocols will keep kids out of school. Every time there is an exposure, kids will be forced out of their schools until it's safe for them to return. And this will obviously be terribly disruptive to both classroom stability and to the educational progress of these children. And although these exposures are probably almost a certainty, I think that we can reduce significantly the frequency of such disruptions with masking. Second, I think as a community, and schools are nothing if not communities of learning and support, uh, communities should do its utmost to promote the safety concerns of its most vulnerable members. Given the rise of the Delta variant, it's um, a grim reality that we are far from the end of this pandemic. So yeah, statistically speaking, young kids are less likely to suffer significant illness. But given that we don't know much about Delta or the long-term impacts of COVID infections or what else the future holds in store for COVID variation, using that statistic as a way to dodge the bare minimum of safety precautions for children is beyond reckless. In effect, there has been no change in the threat that the virus poses to young children since last year when schools were closed. Society is better protected in aggregate due to the vaccine rollout, but child by child, each kid remains just as at risk as they always have been, if not at greater risk due to the Delta variant's transmissibility. Public health is about prevention as much as treatment, and public schools have a mandate to protect 
as much as they have to educate. Finally, I urge you to approve I urge you to approve an NTI option for elementary school kids so that parents who remain apprehensive about sending their unvaccinated kids will have a public school option. And that also and obviously applies to families who disapprove of masking. They should have a public school option if a mask mandate is unacceptable to them. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Next speaker will be Kristen Dodge. Kristen Dodge. Kristen. And after Kristen, there will be Bonnie Logston. Tonight, I'm going to stick with the facts and I've provided you all with all of the facts that I'm citing. What I want you to focus on is this question. What is the goal of requiring the students to wear masks? In May, 2020, the CDC, which is the board's source for COVID recommendations, as well as Stanford University concluded that there is little to no evidence that masks prevent the transmission of small viruses like COVID. July, 2021, per Johns Hopkins University, ages zero to 18 are less likely to spread COVID than other age groups. And this data includes the Delta variant. July 2021, again, according to the CDC this month, as cited by New York Magazine, the rate of death for COVID-19 under the age of 18 is lower than for the flu. The fact that directly from the CDC, our students are more likely to die from the flu begs the question, who are we trying to protect? What is the goal with requiring masks? There's never been a recommendation to mask up for the flu. Why now for COVID? July 2021, again for the CDC, the risk of severe illness and hospitalizations is not increasing. This is July, is not increasing in age group zero to 18 for COVID-19 or the Delta variant. July 2021 for the American Academy of Pediatrics, ages zero to 18 are low risk for being severely ill from COVID. July 2021, zero to 18 age group, according to the CDC, has shown not to be infectors for transmission even prior to the vaccination. July 2021, infectious disease specialists cited state that parents are the ones who can make the most informed decision regarding their child's need to wear a mask, the parents. So let me ask you this. As educators, aren't we also to help the students not only protect their physical well being, but also protect their mental well being? According to Stanford University in 2020, wearing face masks has negative psychological effects, including stress, anxiety, depression, and a decline in their ability to learn. This means that we are already going to be putting the students in a position to continue to struggle at their school. The students are safe. They always have been. Even COVID is sparing the students. You can too by voting against mask requirement. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Bonnie Logston, and be, after Bonnie Logston, there will be Miranda, Miranda Stovall. Bonnie Logston. Bonnie Logston. Okay, we will move on with to Miranda Stovall. Thank you, Miranda, for being here. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. My name is Miranda Stovall. 
I have three kids in District 7. I am here to voice my concerns about this upcoming school year's curriculum. I believe that you are failing the kids in our district. At a time when tensions are high and everyone is stressed, you're creating division and tension and conflict. For example, one of you in front of me posted on Facebook for millions of families to see, quote, the mask waiver conversation started with our white supremacist families, our white East End families won tonight. The losers were our disadvantaged students. Statements like this do not promote unity, but rather division and hatred. They do not give a sense that you have all kids' best interests in mind. You are also failing at transparency. My son's ELA assignment titled The Race Card Project asked the following questions. Are feelings colored? Does black mean angry? If so, then I'm white. Which part of ELA curriculum does that come from? And when do the parents get to see the curriculum? You can claim critical race theory is not being taught in your schools, but all the tenants are there. After looking into your JCPS website, I found things like this. Example one, re-envisioning history, learning about counter narratives to achieve racial equity. Example two, religious equity, race, religion, and privilege, learning more about ways in which privilege disadvantages racial and religious minorities in America and how the list and how individuals can counter those narratives. And the list goes on from there. Meanwhile, your academic stats are alarming at best and a red flag for parents. It seems you are not focused on sending these kids out into the world with the academics of skills they need to be successful, but trying to make such social justice warriors. It also seems you have forgotten that I am the parent and I will teach them morals, values, and have those difficult conversations as needed. As I'm sure you will be with all of your children. So I ask you this, are you going to teach hate, hate and division? Or are you gonna teach love, unity, and the academic skills needed to help these kids realize their full potentials? Yeah. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Charlotte Warren. After Charlotte Warren, there will be Beanie Gohagen. Charlotte Warren. Are you here this evening? Charlotte? Thank you for your time. Um, I'm a retired school teacher with 21 years experience, much of it with JCPS. I know we all want to move forward to protect the children and avoid problems of racism and inequity. When young, I heard former Black Panther Eldridge Cleaver speak, saying that Black Panthers were trained by Marxist, socialist, and communists who taught them to influence people to hate the flag, the pledge, and other national symbols that unite our country. He had hated the American police until he saw how people were treated in socialist communist countries. Recently, a local ministry sent me Dr. Moreland's sermon about social justice. When Marxism takes over a country, they start a war between the rich and the poor, the oppressor and the victim. This didn't work in the US because of our middle class. So they use race, whites the oppressors and blacks the victim. After seeing this, I decided to do an investigation into JCPS and this is what I found. I discovered that words like racist, anti-racist, democracy, democracy, <laughs> equity, white supremacy, and others have been redefined. These words are actually, actually have now two meanings. According to JCPS own materials linked from the ARE to glossary, you are a racist or white supremacist if you deny you have white privilege. Uh, if you believe it, that we are one humanity, or if you say, I never owned a slave. JCPS materials, professional development and lessons are pervasive with Marxist oppression and victimhood. 
This is anti-racism, racism, and it's big business. Dr. Carol Swain, a black lawyer and civil rights uh, social scientist, expert on white supremacy from Princeton and Vanderbilt said uh, that critical race theory may violate uh, civil rights and constitutional laws. So are we teaching critical race theory? Yes. In the special board meeting minutes of March 23rd, 2021, a member, one of y'all, asks how are we embedding it in the curriculum, not if we are embedding it. However disturbing the things we have seen happening in other states with critical race theory, it's all happening right here. The covert white supremacist pyramid, the white racist baby child chart, abolitionist teaching that the Fed recently denounced and so on. For next steps going forward, I respectfully ask that all the employees and board members reread the code of ethics for administrator or teacher certification. They are to believe in the worth and dignity of each person, even whites. They are not to misrepresent the facts and not to promote political views or candidates professionally. Please don't put administ <laughs> please don't put administration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Beanie Gohagan. Our next speaker is Beanie Gohagan. After Benny, Benny Gohagan, it will be Karen Lofasik, Benny Gohagan. And after Ms. Gohagan, there will be uh, Karen Lofasik. JCPS has 35 of the 50 comprehensive support and improvement schools in the state, which means we have 70% of the schools identified as the lowest performing schools in Kentucky. Kentucky ranks 45th in the country. Where does this put our students when they go out into the workforce? In 2019, the last time KPREP was taken, only 37.2% of our high school students scored proficient or distinguished in literacy, and the math proficiency rate was 30.5%. With achievement data like this, my problem-solving mind tells me it is time to get back to the basics. The role of the public schools is to cultivate the next generation of well-educated citizenry who can think intelligently for themselves. That is not happening in our district. There are decades of studies and solid evidence demonstrating the benefits of early literacy. In fact, students who learn to read by the time they are in third grade are exponentially more likely to stay in school, succeed in school, and go on to pursue higher education or a solid career in a trade. This information would lead one to assume those in charge of ensuring quality education for so many students would be focusing on early literacy programs that have proven results. In JCPS, we have 93 elementary schools. 23 of those have a high transient population. Wouldn't it make more sense for the board to be encouraging those 23 schools to share a common literacy program so when a child moves four times in second grade, he can learn to read in a more seamless way? Instead, our board is more focused on these schools promoting racial equity theories and programs that have very limited evidence to support demonstrable improvement in basic student achievement. Six million dollars is a lot of taxpayer money to spend on such theories when we aren't even meeting the basic educational needs of so many students. There is much focus on equity across the country and in our district right now. The word equity sounds appealing until you realize it actually means forced equality of outcomes. I have four children who have received the same parenting resources and opportunities. They do not have the same GPAs, ACT scores, jobs, or money in their savings accounts. As prominent intellectual Thomas Sowell observed, if you cannot achieve a quality of performance among people born to the same parents and raised under the same roof, how realistic is it to expect to achieve it across broader and deeper social divisions? At the end of the day, outcome is beyond the control of even parents much less the school board or teachers. I am all for wraparound services for those students who need them, but our job is to provide equal opportunities, do our best to teach each individual child, and keep no child from reaching their potential, not equalize outcomes. I believe we are committing the most unjust and equitable crime of all by allowing students to simply move through the system without gaining the skills they need upon graduation. All in the name of equity, we teach them that they can break the rules and suffer no consequences, skip assignments and still pass the class stay home and still move to the next grade. These are basic skills that employers will expect their employees to have and will require before awarding promotions. Talk about setting kids up for failure. Nobody benefits from the lowering of standards and expectations. I will end with this. School choice has proven to raise student achievement across race, ethnicity, religion, and background. If you truly want to improve students, if you truly want to improve outcomes for all students, stop focusing
Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker. Our next speaker. Our next speaker is Karen Lukasik. Karen, are you here this evening? Karen. If Karen is not here, Dr. Lance Pearson. Dr. Lance Pearson. Thank you for being here. Karen Lukasik. I'm very sorry. Uh, Welcome. Thank can, you. Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, I want to thank you for uh, allowing me to talk for a few minutes today. I'm a retired nurse with over 40 years of hospital caregiving. I come to you having experienced a long circle of life with JCPS, beginning with my children in the 1990s and through May of this year with my grandson, who finished third grade most of which was done online learning. I also can compare my own experiences of schooling back in the 60s, and I have my experience in Chicago with my daughter in the 80s to compare to. But I wanna jump into the circle of 1998, when my son was seven years old and a second grader struggling to learn how to read from a teacher that chose to use a whole language approach. This was a popular method to teach children that turned out to be an absolute failure and has been discarded. I wanna to cut to the chase. He ended up learning to spell, read, and comprehend language through the good old fashioned way of phonetic teaching. And he was taught to read by his parents. By high school, he was asking us several times over the years to take him out of JCPS and homeschool him but we have got jobs. We wanted the onus of learning to be on his shoulders and his responsibility, but in retrospect, I have come to regret that decision. Now, fast forward to 20 years, March, 2020, I'm retired as is my husband, the world's in lockdown, and my seven-year-old grandson is in second grade, struggling to learn how to read but this time online using an instruction on a computer that no one seems to be overly concerned that this would be an especially difficult task for children that are learning to read. So now we're responsible for teaching our grandson how to read, but at least it was done with the leisure of a lockdown. So what other difficulties did we encounter with the online experience? Well the word glitches is permanently cemented in his vocabulary forever. <laughs> the curriculum was non-controversial for a third grader. It was appropriate. Oh. And uh, uh, let's see, how much time do I have now? 30 seconds. Oh, okay. 30. <laughs> I wrote too much. But I wonder if you could do better. I wonder about if this reaction to the pandemic why you didn't use better critical thinking skills that you have touted for so long. You know that Sweden was open the whole time. Thank you for being here this evening. Dr. Lance Pearson, Dr. Lance Pearson. Hello. Hi, I'm Dr. Lance Pearson. I'm a product of the Oldham County Public so uh, School System. I've got four post-secondary degrees, a PhD in the hard sciences. The last six years I've spent doing data science for billion dollar organizations and the last two analyzing healthcare data. So the topic I wanna to talk about is putting some of the risk that our students are um, exposed to due to COVID into perspective. So don't get lost in some of these numbers. Uh, according to the last census, the US population under the age of 18 was 74.6 million. Of those, 337 children under the age of 18 died during the last 18 months. 
so only 337. So to put that in perspective, over the last 18 months, when we were going through the height of the pandemic and we had no exposure to vaccinations in the general public, uh, the probability of a child dying from COVID was one in 221,000. Or if we were to take that on a 12 month basis, one in 331,000. Now for perspective, the, the average likelihood of a person being struck by lightning in the United States in a given year is about one in 500,000 according to the CDC. So in other words, it was more likely that a student would be struck by lightning than die from COVID during the first 12 months, the worst 12 months of the pandemic. So what does it look like projecting forward? Remember that due to Project Warp Speed, we are now in a situation where 90% of the people over 65 have now received at least one injection of the vaccine and 80% have received over two doses. Nearly 70% of the whole population over the, 18, over the age of 18 has received at least one dose. So in short, we have established uh, nearly herd immunity. It's not a yes, we have herd immunity or no, we don't have herd immunity thing. It's a scale and we are well on the way. Our current death rate is lower than it was since uh, April 6th at the beginning of the pandemic before we had any mitigating factors. So in other words, there's nearly no risk that we are exaggerating here. Also, the study that Dr. Polio cited merely stated that masks were adequate. It didn't say that they were necessary in order to prevent COVID transmission. It also was a report, not a peer reviewed study. And they were essentially comparing all school districts that, that had used masking. It was not a comparison of masking versus non-masking in the school district, which is what we're discussing now. All right, I'll end with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is James Deering. Our next speaker is James Deering. Our next speaker is James Deering. Following Mr. Deering will be Natalie Rawlings. Following Mr. Deering will be Natalie Rawlings. A history lesson for all of you. It all started with Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto. Then came along two Italian socialists, Antonio Gramsci and Jorge Lukacs. Gramsci developed the idea that tearing down society was a necessary precursor for global Marxism. Luk Lukacs built on Gramsci by developing the idea that dialectic materialism was not a tool for Marx or was not a tool for Marxism, but rather the very tool for tearing down society itself. He postulated that destroying the status quo in the minds of the people would be bring about Marxism. Basically, he thought that they needed to tear down societal norms and eliminate its history in order to build it back up as the revolutionaries desired with Marxist socialism. Lukacs later met up with Felix Weil, the rich grandson of a Jewish German capitalist with a lot of free time on his hands, much like today's rich college students in America. Felix funded the Institute for Social Research, later known as the Frankfurt School. At the Frankfurt School, Felix Weil brought in Herbert Marcuse and Max Horkheimer, amongst other socialist philosophers. It was at the Frankfurt School where Max Horkheimer coined the phrase critical theory, which states that all societal institutions must be destroyed and the concept of normal be decimated in order to bring about Marxist socialism. Herbert Marcuse best summed it up by labeling critical theory as a diverse and diffused dispersion of the whole system. They all ended up fleeing Germany in the 30s because of Hitler and were welcomed into the US with open arms. However, the chickens did not realize that we had just invited the fox into the hen house and all the Marxists from the Franker School settled right in to teach at Columbia, Chicago, New York universities and spread their Marxist and critical theory ideologies. Critical theory is a process by which it attempts to destroy the entire culture by tearing down its history and tradition and replace it with Marxist socialism. It's a process where the proponents criticize everybody, everything, everywhere, all the time. Sound familiar? It's, it's an ideology that attacks and tears down good societies using all the collegiate ologies. Critical theory's basic principle is an unending criticism of normal, 
and the status quo in order to wear down society at large until the masses are gaslighted enough into accepting the replacement, Marxist socialism. Their plan is to engage and confuse society regarding true history and the real benefits of capitalism to the extent that it becomes meaningless and pointless to hold on to tradition and the old ways. Therefore, all of society has to be criticized ad nauseum. Just look around at what is happening all across America today. Exactly what I just described. Exactly what critical theory instructs its followers to do. Remember, critical theory is not about race. It is, that's a distraction. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wholly and thoroughly rejected critical race theory. It is a means to an end, and the end being Marxist socialism. Take note. Thank you. Our next speaker is Natalie Rawlings. Natalie Rawlings. Natalie Rawlings. And after that will be Diane Stephen. Diane Stephen will follow that speaker. I would appreciate it. You can step outside if you like. You can step outside if you like. Well, we're going to have a meeting and we're going to take care of our business. Please go forward with your speaking. Thank you. Thank you. First off, I'd like to just say thank you for letting me speak tonight. Several other people have spoken to the topic of masks and have done excellent with the points and similar to what I would have stated. So I'm going to keep this short and sweet. As a parent, I would like to say, please leave the decision to masks up to the parents. Keep your mandates and masks off my children who would like to be children without the added smothering of a mask and the constant reminder that they are supposed to live in fear from a virus that they are in the lowest risk category of experiencing. Please leave the masks off of our children if we choose so. Thank you. Our next speaker is Diane Stephen. Our next speaker is Diane Stephen, and after that is Andrew West. Diane Stephen, and then Andrew West. Good evening. Tonight I address the July 11th mass mandate labeled as the back to school plan. The board claims the government and national medical persons as experts. Well, I'm an informed medical citizen. I'm a registered nurse, a parent, and a grandparent. Tonight, I represent students, parents, and those who are no longer going to accept overreaching government, medical tyranny, school board, and teacher union mandates. We are here to be heard. We, too, have medical facts, experts, and legal advisors who guide us in our decisions. Our students do not belong to the state. They do not belong to the board. They are our children and we are here to reject mass mandates. We are here to stop the endless fear mongering and we are here to stop having our individual and children rights trampled upon. Our experts, uh, I have expert handouts, and all of which the board has the expert handouts. They are available for you uh, when the meeting's over with, if you want any of those hand handouts. I shall quickly summarize these professionals and the research. Mass mandates are harming the sociological and developmental progress of our students reference to. Masks create a threatening and unsafe environment where physical and emotional connection become difficult, reference 20. It is a myth that masks prevent viruses from spreading. The size of a virus is too small to be stopped by a cloth of surgical mask, reference one. And it's like throwing sand through a chain link fence. Even the CDC states surgical masks do not catch harmful smoke particles and smoke particles are five times larger than viruses. Viruses enter and exit through masks pores, but bacteria, now they will stay inside of the mask, uh, exposing the wearer to a host of bacterial infections. And needless to say, when the wearer adjusts his or her mask, these bacteria are readily absorbed onto the face, eyes, nose, and worst of all, hands. Taiwan, a Taiwan study found that their healthcare workers wearing N95 masks experienced decreased oxygen blood levels and increased CO2 levels, reference 16. Other studies show that surgeons had higher oxygen blood levels before surgery than after lengthy surgeries. 
Lastly, mandating wearing emergency use approved medical therapy, i.e. masks, is illegal without informed consent of the wearer and or his or her parents or guardians. The right is rooted in the Nuremberg Code, the Helsinki Declaration, and the Code of Federal Ethics. The law is very clear. All participants. Our next speaker is Andrew West. Our next speaker is Andrew West. After Andrew West, there will be Ryan Morrison. After Andrew West, there will be Ryan Morrison. Mr. West, please. Thank you for your time, board members. I am a physician and I have spent many hours analyzing data from the CDC website. Based on that, opin based on that information, in my professional opinion, there is no need to require school children to wear masks. My reason for this opinion is that COVID-19 is less dangerous than the common flu for children under age 18. We've already heard a lot of good data about that. That is absolutely true. Uh, the numbers are that about three in one million children are, have, have died in the last 18 months due to the COVID, uh, due to the COVID virus. By comparison, uh, anywhere between three and 13 children die per million children from the flu vaccine. The flu vaccine, pardon me, the flu virus. Therefore, the flu virus is much more deadly to children than the COVID virus. If we do not require children, and we have never required children to wear uh, masks for the flu, then it makes absolutely no sense for us to require children to wear masks in order to prevent them from getting COVID. COVID is just not dangerous for children, especially now that we have much better treatments, we know much more about the disease. At the beginning of the COVID era, we were told by government officials and supposed experts that we needed to wear masks, social distance, and lock down the economy temporarily for two weeks until it was clear that we had sufficient hospital capacity to handle the sick. Once it was clear that the hospitals could handle the COVID patients, our officials changed their minds and told us that the goal was to stay in lockdown until we had a vaccine. Now that we have a vaccine that is effective and almost every adult has either had COVID, which offers better immunity than a vaccine, or had the opportunity to be vaccinated, we are told that we still need to be afraid of COVID and force our ch school children to wear masks. This makes no sense. We have a year and a half of experience with treating COVID patients. We are much better at avoiding morbidity and mortality from it now than we were 18 months ago. Although the Delta variant is present, it seems to be much less dangerous than the original COVID strain. Now that we have, uh, now that we have all this experience and capacity to prevent and treat COVID, what is the end goal? What are we trying to do by masking children? Is it to create no COVID cases? I have heard no one articulate an end goal for, for this masking that we're undergoing now. When will we be able to go back to normal? The government has not told us any end goal. I'm afraid that our authorities will have us locked down indefinitely, perhaps out of a sense of fear or a desire to control people as much as possible. It is not realistic to expect there to be zero cases of COVID, just as we cannot reasonably expect to have zero cases of flu. In summary, COVID is less dangerous to our children than the flu. Let's think for ourselves and have a little courage. We've needlessly disrupted the lives of, of our children enough. Don't make them wear masks. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ryan Morrison. Ryan Morrison and Terrence Sullivan will follow Ryan Morrison. I'd just like to share a few, um, not a few, several bullet points with you. Um, let's try to remember the first principle of the public school system, that it exists for the students and not the teachers. And uh, the second principle is there will never be zero COVID in our world. So we have to learn to live with it like all the other risks in our life. The CDC and the Academy of Pediatricians are focusing on the theoretical, but we should consider the practical information like the observed data that we have because these events actually happened. They're not on a spreadsheet. They're not a formula. Early in the pandemic, scientists discovered people less than 40 years old had a less than 1% chance of dying from COVID. As of July 21st of this year, like the doctor said, only 337 kids in the United States under 18 died because of COVID. Of the 73 million kids in the US, that leads to a death rate of 
zero, 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 four, six percent. As of July 24th of this year, only 3,262 kids in the United States under 18 have been hospitalized because of COVID. And of the 73 million kids in the US, that's a rate of 0.0045%. By comparison, he mentioned getting struck by lightning, but the percentage chance of somebody getting struck in a lifetime is 0.0065%. Um, die, of dying in an accident at your home, that's 0.053%. And being in a car wreck for every thousand miles you drive, is 0.27%. So all three of those things are more dangerous than contracting COVID. And of the kids who do contract COVID, only 0.1% or 1.9% even go to the hospital. And that is believed to be overstated by 40% upon subsequent study. And if they do contract COVID, the risk of getting the multisystem inflammatory syndrome is less than one in a thousand. And as of May of this year, Adult vaccinations have lowered COVID infections in kids by 50%. And the chance of asymptomatic person infecting a close contact of anybody of any age is 0.7%, which yields a scant 0.0007, that's four zeros, chance that a close contact will give COVID to a child. And with respect to Dr. Polio's Duke study, I refer him to the Wall Street Journal on July 8th of this year. Duke researcher Tom Nicholson refuted it like the doctor said, there was no control group without mask. And he concluded the researchers might as well have attributed the low COVID rate in schools to wearing shoes, end quote. <laughs> we, know, we know that children are extremely low risk of getting COVID. Thank you. Our next speaker is Terrence Sullivan. Terrence Sullivan is our next speaker. Thank you. And after Terrence Sullivan, there will be Tara Green. Tara Green. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. This are, okay. <clears throat> Before I start, I just wanted to say um, I would never use the word only as a modifier talking about the death of a child. <laughs> Good evening, Chair Porter and board. My name is Terrence Sullivan, and I'm speaking to you wearing two hats, but from a similar perspective, that of racial equity. <clears throat> Hat number one, as, a, as the executive director of the Kentucky Commission on Human Rights. Hat number two, as the vice chair for JCPS Advisory Council on Racial Equity. Both of these perspectives intersect addressing the racial inequities that can be addressed through proper, proper COVID mitigation strategies adopted by this board and the district. Health inequities are real, and this virus has done nothing but exacerbate those differences. Health inequities refer to systematic differences in the underlying health of a community. The lower income and more black, Hispanic, Latinx communities of Louisville have seen inequitably high rates of infection and death due to COVID-19. This is further impacted by poverty and chronic illnesses that create a higher risk for complications and higher death rates. When it comes to equity in how we address these health disparities, universal masking as recommended by Dr. Polio is the safest direct option that can be taken. Further, in order to really address the disparate health impacts for students of color, a target date for 100% staff vaccination is paramount. Other large municipalities are taking this step and including school officials, and this is the best way to improve health outcomes for all students, not just the ones who reside in the wealthiest zip codes. The Delta variant is serious. This strain is twice the potency of the initial strain that saw us completely reimagine schooling and society. Looking at data, research has shown that most transmission in schools spreads from adult teacher to student. If these students were returning home to vaccinated communities, that's one thing, but that's not the case here. Looking at the most recent data, for example, black residents of Jefferson County are vaccinated at a much lower percentage, making up 13% of the vaccinated population. The overall vaccination rate for lower income neighborhoods is between zero and 30%, whereas more affluent areas are closer to 70%. There are children to protect, and this is a way to do it. 
currently around 16.8% of students 10 to 14 are vaccinated. Granted, that starts at age 12 and 37.5% ages 15 to 19. Those are not great odds and not as logistically plausible to address as staff status. This helps protect those vulnerable populations while also combating the virus in the classroom. The school should also play a leading role. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Tara Green. After Tara Green, there will be Debbie Robbins. Um, Ms. Green. Thank you. Um, my name is Tara Green. I am a therapist and hold a master's in counseling psychology. I have three sons who are current JCPS students, and I'm very concerned about the educational, social, emotional, and physiological impact wearing masks all day will have on my sons and all JCPS students. I asked the board to answer some important questions related to masks. Can you tell me the psychological impact wearing a mask all day will have on my six-year-old son? Can you tell me the educational impact wearing a mask all day will have on my 10-year-old? Can you tell me the social and emotional impact wearing a mask all day will have on my 13-year-old? These are not insignificant issues that should be dismissed with, oh, they'll be fine. They won't. The impact is great and the effects are lasting. And the real question is for what? The case fatality rate for children is zero. As adults, we sometimes forget to put ourselves in children's shoes and see the world the way they do. I would like to give us an example and scale for this. If you research the height of a six-year-old, the average six-year-old and the average adult female, you will see that a teacher is on average one and a half times the height of her student. When kindergartners walk into a new school for the first time, they will be greeted by a person they do not know. Their moms and dads won't be there. Their siblings won't be with them. Their friends, their comforts won't be with them. This would be like the average man walking into a foreign place, leaving behind everything familiar and being led by an eight foot tall stranger with their face half covered. No smile to reassure them, only muffled voices under a mask that are hard to understand. For a kindergartner walking into a school building for the first time, it's a scary thing. And masks make this experience even scarier. And for what? What are we going to this length for? Children do not spread the virus. Did you know that suicide is the second leading cause of death for children? This is much more of a problem than COVID-19. What are you doing to mitigate this for our JCPS student? Guess what influences a child's decision to attempt suicide? Social and emotional issues. So again, I ask, what social and emotional impact will not being able to communicate effectively and see half of a person's face have on our children? If you talk to any teacher directly, they will tell you that obstructing their mouths while teaching hinders the learning process for students. I believe that educating students should be the number one goal of schools and therefore should be the number one goal of this board. So again, I ask, can you tell me the educational impact of wearing a mask when trying to learn? And for what? I urge the board to consider education at its number one goal and leave the health concerns to the parents. Giving parents a choice in the matter of masking does not mean children cannot wear masks if they would like. It means that parents determine the health measures for their children and the board can... Thank you. Our next speaker is Debbie Robbins. Debbie Robbins. After Debbie Robbins, there will be Tammy Oliver. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I want to say, first of all, I'm a Kentuckian. I'm an American. I love my country. I love God. And I love everybody in this room. I want you to know that. And I want to say to the board tonight, Fayette County and Oldham County are allowing parents to decide whether or not their children wear masks. And I want to say to you, Dr. Polio, of whom we know each other, I am vehemently disappointed in you tonight, sir. I really am. When I spoke to you two years ago at a Jefferson Town High School alumni dinner, your, your biggest complaint was that parents need to parent their children and not expect uh, JCPS to do so. So we're asking you tonight to let us parent our children and take care of their medical health. I want to say that, you know, the other thing I want to say tonight is God looks at our hearts. 
he doesn't care what color you are. If you're ugly on your heart, you're an ugly person. And I want to say to the board tonight, I want to respectfully ask you with all my heart that you have got to let your pride go tonight. And you've got to allow our children, us to take care of our children. I, I'm so sick to death of people living in fear. We are not, I am not afraid. God is my, my redeemer, my savior, and he takes care of us. But mainly he put me in charge of my son, my child. And, and the Bible says, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. And you know what? I want you to know, do not be deceived. If you vote against the people tonight, which I know I represent this community with my opinion, amen, I know I do. I know it. If I'm just asking you respectfully, respectfully to hear me as a mom, hear me as a mother, and know that if you don't, God, you know, do not, do not be deceived because God will not be mocked. A man reaps what he <laughs> sows. Do not sow. And if you do not give us our rights as parents because we are Americans and we are free, then I'm asking you respectfully tonight, you need to resign. And I'm going to run for Duncan's seat. And lastly, I don't know, I feel like I'm living in the twilight zone. I literally feel like I'm living in the twilight zone. If this is a money issue, we're all asking, what is the end game? Is it money for our district that you're after? If so, shame on you. I don't know what it is, but again, I'm just asking you respectfully, as a mom and as a wife and as a daughter and as a product of Jefferson County Public Schools and the mother of a son, be brave. Take that mask off your face. You're not going to get sick tonight. But may Thank you. Tammy Oliver, Tiffany Calvert, Chuck Eddy, and then there will be one after that, and then we will have reached, we have actually gone beyond our 45 minutes. So Tammy Oliver, Tiffany Calvert, and then I will do the last two after that. Ms. Oliver. Thank you. Um, I too have a study that I brought forth, Dr. Polio, and this study was put out on May the 28th, and this study was done at the University of Louisville, and the study that they published was a randomized trial of the eff efficacy of masks during COVID-19. They took data from the CDC and other data agencies, and they put together and they hypothesized that statewide mask mandates and mask use was, would lower COVID-19 rates in the United States. To their surprise, but not mine, they found that it did not change the data significantly. They, they, they even uh, mentioned a Danish study that found no protective benefit of medical masks against COVID-19 infection. And they even mentioned that viral infections were more common for Vietnamese clinicians with cloth masks than with medical or no masks. They also found little association between COVID-19 case growth with regards to whether or not there was a mask mandate or not. They looked at whether or not states laid down mandates early, late, or in the middle of the pandemic. And they found that there was not a significant change in the number of cases with masks. They said mandates are not associated with state COVID growth, case growth. Contrary to their hypothesis, early mandates were not associated with lower case growth. Maximum case, case growth was the same among states with early, late, and no mandates. This indicates that mask mandates were not predictive of slower COVID-19 spread when communi community trans mission rates were low or high. They also noted that it was it, for students, well, they didn't specify students, but they did note that it was not healthy to wear masks 
more than four hours to a day. They noted that it promoted facial alkali alkalinization and it inadvertently encouraged dehydration, which in turn can enhance barrier breakdown and facial infection. So basically they found that wearing masks for more than four hours a day breaks down your skin barrier and allows you to get more infections than you would if you were not wearing a mask. And I'd like to end by saying that the, the lady who went before me that said Fayette County, there are, there is a, there is data that they put together with the Thank you very much. <laughs> Tiffany Calvert, Tiffany Calvert, and then Chuck Eddy, Tiffany Calvert. Good evening, my name is Tiffany Calvert. I am a professor at the University of Louisville and the proud parent of a first grader at Hawthorne Elementary, go Hawks. First, I wanna thank the board and all the JCPS teachers and staff for their incredibly hard work past school year in support of our students in a difficult environment, transferring quickly and expertly to a hybrid model. I appreciate your hard work. Thank you also, Dr. Polio and the board for advocating a universal masking policy for the start of the school year. I think we can all agree that our collective top priority is to get students back in the classroom and the best and most equitable way to do this, to provide equitable public education for all students in Louisville is to provide them a safe environment. I, the overwhelming evidence in support of keeping that goal of keeping students in the classrooms as safely as possible is to maintain universal masking and masks are only one piece of this evidence-based approach. I support layered strategies, including distancing cohorts and air quality measures. I wanna remind everyone here that we protect not only children who cannot yet get vaccinated, but all of the most vulnerable people in our society who either cannot receive the vaccine and who live in a home with a child or are under things like chemotherapy, multiple sclerosis or cancer treatment. We are protecting all of them as well. To end, I hope JCPS will adopt the CDC recommendation released today and a universal mask policy for K through 12 for the protection of all our students and teachers. Thank you so much. Chuck Eddy, Chuck Eddy. Good evening, thank you board members. Uh, we've had 611,251 American deaths due to COVID-19. That's unnecessary. Dr. John Campbell of England recently discussed a study for Delta variant that says the viral load is 1200 times worse than the original COVID-19. That study has been posted on virological.org. Masks have been shown to reduce the spread of disease by reducing the spread of droplets and aerosol transmission. Unfortunately, in our country and state, everyone did not mask up. It's not a personal choice or a matter of liberty, it's a matter of public health. It has been since day one. The high numbers of COVID-19 cases and deaths in our country have been due to people fighting masking, social distancing, and now vaccinations. To show how serious this disease is, the Veterans Administration has just issued the following. Veterans Administration issues vaccine mandate for healthcare workers of first for federal agency employees who provide direct patient care have eight weeks to get inoculated against the coronavirus or face penalties, including possible removal. We need to maximize masking in schools to reduce the spread of COVID-19. We need to prevent the spread to kids too young to get the vaccine. We need to prevent spread to people like my friend that can't get vaccinated due to legitimate uh, medical reasons. We need to prevent the spread to teachers. In order to maintain in-person learning as long as possible, we need to keep infections down. Masking is the best defense and vaccinations, of course. COVID-19 has been shown to not just make people very sick and die. There are many other debilitating results as well. It is not a binary choice, death or health. 
While children did not seem as susceptible earlier, the current Delta variant is sickening younger and younger people. In Kentucky, from June 15th to July 14th, zero to nine years old, the cases increased 110%. 10 to 19 years old, they increased 104%. 20 to 29, they increased 84%, and 30 to 39, 55%. We know that the Delta variant is growing very rapidly amongst unvaccinated. Bottom line, we need to require masks in schools as much as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Our last speaker before we return to our agenda is Tara Walker. After Ms. Walker, we will take a five minute break. We will continue with our business. And at the end of the meeting, the additional speakers will be allowed to speak. Tara Walker. Thank you, board members and Dr. Pope. Thank you for thinking about the teachers, Dr. Pope. This is not what I want to talk about, and I'm so sorry. But I have been sitting out here listening to this. I, I want to thank you all for thinking about the teachers who have to be in the building with students and other teachers. And you all want us to be protected. You all want us to go home and be able to raise our family. For some of you all who don't know, I have nine children now because my sister died and my mother is dead. So guess what? I have to raise my kids. I want to be COVID free so that I can continue to raise the nine children that I have inherited over the past four months. So thank you, board members and Dr. Polio for thinking about the teachers and the educators in the building. Now to CRT, critical race theory. I'm standing here now as a Kentucky Alliance co-chair, if I have time. I want to read our statement. There is no cause to fear teaching the history of Black people in this country or the system created in our history to maintain slavery. Critical race theory is not a relevant topic in JCPS or any other K through 12 school in Kentucky. It is not being considered, nor is it being discussed in our other curriculum. Even those who say these, sorry, they oppose efforts to teach about racism in this country agree with us in the basic tenets of equality and truth. Let's work to bring equality, truth, understanding, and compassion to the youth together. Fear of education has gone too far. Our founding fathers were enlightened, highly educated men, but they lived in a different century, a different United States. We aren't seeking to re-erase or validate the men who risked their lives to create the Declaration of Independence or pin the Constitution from which our rights are, our rights, excuse me, are born. We are simply trying to update our education to match the present. The original sin of this country will never heal if we refuse to see it. It is time to stop teaching our children alternate facts. It's time to stop pretending this country was built by white scholars while hiding black leaders and making slavery sound like a loving arrangement. It is time for black children to see images of themselves in history books. It is time to acknowledge the price black people were forced to pay to build this country. It is time to put all facts in our curriculum, regardless of whether they have people uncomfortable, growth and learning are born only from expanding the mind with knowledge. We are not wanting to teach hate, we are here to teach love and the truth. Thank you. At this time, the board will recess for five minutes. We are recessed for five minutes. For those who wish to leave, please do so now. We will return to our business agenda and then we will return to our speakers. Five minutes, please. 